Today we are starting with the renal system, right? First we'll start with the renal physiology. And once we have done a good understanding of the renal physiology, we'll build over that the disturbance of renal function. That is renal pathology. Renal physiology means that how the renal system functions normally. And when the system of the renal system is disturbed in its function and structure, we say there is renal pathology. And after that, we'll go to the renal uh, pharmacology. So before we really delve into details of renal system, we'll, uh, we'll discuss the very, very basic concepts. Later on, of course, we'll go into very big detail how the nephron works, how every part of nephron works. But first of all, we'll, talk, we'll start our lecture with the very basic, right? Number one, what are the functions of renal system? Functions of renal system. This is the first aspect which we'll cover first of all, right? And second aspect I, will, I would love to cover is that hormones and kidneys. Hormones and kidneys. After that I will go really into detail how the nephrons handle different substances, right? During urine formation. So what are the normal functions of kidney? Yes, please. Okay, we we'll start like this that kidney can do number one, it has some excretory functions, right? There are excretory functions. Everyone knows, even a small child knows. When mama and papa tell the urine is coming from the kidney, right? It, it eliminates the waste product. Number two, the adrenal system is concerned with regulatory functions. We'll talk about what are those regulatory functions. Regulatory, regulatory functions. Right? There are excretory functions. There are some substances which are excreted through the kidney, the waste products, we'll talk into detail. Then the other substances which are regulated, the balance is regulated in the body by the kidneys. Then there are endocrine functions of the kidney. Kidney is an endocrine organ as well. So, endocrine functions. And, of course, at the end, we'll come to the last most important function. I don't know, somehow doctors or students don't remember that. And that is the metabolic functions of the kidney. It's a metabolic organ as well. Metabolic functions of the kidney. It means, the kidneys are excretory organs, they are regulatory organs for certain substances in the blood, they are endocrine organs as well as the metabolically active of course. So first we go into detail that what are the substances which are excreted through the kidney, right? What are the substances which are excreted through kidney? In the next section we will discuss about the hormones. So first of all, kidneys are, kidneys are supposed to excrete the metabolic waste products like urea and creatinine. So first thing is metabolic waste products. What is the second function of the kidney? Second excretory function of the kidney. Of course, when you are taking food, a lot of metabolism is going on and during those metabolic functions, some waste products are produced and many of these waste products go out through urine. At the top, you must remember urea and creatinine. Is that right? Here, when we talk about metabolic waste products, and I've mentioned that there is urea and creatinine, urea and creatinine. You know, normally the levels of urea and creatinine are checked into urine to see the renal function. You know this? That if your renal function is disturbed, then in the blood, urea and creatinine level may be disturbed. You know it, that's great. I want to know, out of these two, for example, a patient comes to you and his renal function is already known that renal function of the patient is disturbed. You would love to do uh, serum urea level and serum creatinine level. But if you have to do one test, not both tests, which test is the gold standard for renal function? Creatinine. Creatinine. Uh, what about you? Urea, okay. Shireen thinks that it's creatinine, Abbas thinks it's urea. You are with whom? Urea. You are with urea. What about Vakas? Urea. You are also urea man. Urea. urea. So what we decide, that majority is not always right. Shireen is right. 
the gold standard for the renal function is creatinine. Write it down and put a star with it. If you really want to know why urea is wrong, I can explain that. Or you are not interested in explanation. No, you are already very much sad. Okay, let me tell you, it's important to tell. Actually, the creatinine level in blood is mainly dependent on renal function. If kidneys are not doing working well, GFR is not there, filtration is not there, creatinine start going up. Of course, with that, urea also goes up. But urea has a problem. The urea level goes up not only in the renal dysfunction, but urea level goes up even many other conditions. For example, uh, if uh, you develop, uh, you, you undergo severe or you can say uh, too much sweating, right, and you dehydrate, then what will happen? Everything in the blood will concentrate and urea specifically concentrate. So urea level may go up not only in renal failure, urea level may also go up when you, when you have severe dehydration, whatever the cause. Or you have severe vomiting, you have severe diarrhea, right? Or you have polyuria, you are losing water out of the body. In vomiting you lose the water, in diarrhea you may lose a lot of water, in polyuria you lose the water, and or excessive sweating. Under all these circumstances when you are losing a heavy amount of water out of the body, urea rapidly concentrates. Is that right? So urea may be high when kidney may not be so much disturbed simply by dehydration. Then another thing, you know urea is a breakdown product coming from amino acids. Everyone knows it, right? If one day you go to a special party and there's a competition who eats more chicken and who eats more beef and who eats more mutton and maybe Mr. Vakas Siddhu, he wins, the, wins in the party. He eats everyone's mutton and he becomes the champion. But after a few hours, urea level in the blood will go high because he has taken too much proteins. So a lot of amino acids are breaking down and urea level will go up. I hope his kidneys will be still okay. You get me? So the point which I want to put in your mind is that when you go to the, you have to, you know, correlate the basics with the clinical. That when we are talking about urea and creatinine, usually when kidney fail, both go up. But Urea may go up in the blood even in those conditions when kidney is functioning okay, like high protein diet, like dehydration, right? And there are some other conditions also. So urea is not the gold standard for renal functional impairment. For renal failure, the gold standard is creatinine. Is it clear? Okay, so we were talking about that kidney is involved in some excretory functions and in this, this, these excretory functions, most important is that kidney should get out of the body all the metabolic, most of the metabolic waste products. Then any other substance which is excreted out of the, through urine? Do you know any other substance? Yes, Dr. Nazanin? Any other substance you can imagine in your life, up to now you studied a lot of medicine that some substances are going out through the urine. Yes? Okay, he's a great man. He says water goes out of the body. Listen, don't write it first. We agree water goes out. But the reason is that water is not usually an excretory product. Actually, kidney gets rid of the water while regulating the water balance. If there's less water in the body, kidney will conserve the water. If there's excessive water intake, kidney will flush out the water. So, more appropriately, uh, it should be the regulatory function of fluid balance in the body. You are understanding? So, we'll discuss that here. So, I'm talking about truly waste products, which we don't want to accumulate in the body. Why don't you tell me, please? You, why don't you tell me something very important, like drugs? Do you think all your life you have taken so many drugs, all are stuck in your body? No, they go out of your body, right? Either they go through fecal route or they go through urinary route. So you have to remember that renal system is extremely important in getting rid of drugs, many drugs. Otherwise, you know, you have been taking aspirin and so many drugs you have taken from your childhood up to now. Uh, maybe this uh, uh, this man, a boss, he will become just bag of the tablets. But thank God not. Because you keep on taking the drugs. Drugs are altered in the body usually. Alteration of the drug is called biotransformation. So drugs undergo biotransformation and they become more water soluble. And then they go out of the body. Right? 
So other, do you know that uh, drug metabolites, which will go out through urine, of course, they should be water soluble. They should be water soluble. Here, there's an interesting situation that uh, anything which has to go out of the body through the kidney, it must be water soluble. Anything which has to go out of the body through kidney, it should be water soluble, right? Uh, who is uh, having the real idea that, you know, okay, let me tell you something interesting. I'll make a small diagram and Mr. Sean will highlight this. Suppose this is your, okay, I will make this diagram on this side. Let's suppose that here is your GIT, right? Here is your liver. I'm going to tell you how kidney handles along with the liver and other circulatory system, your, and this is the nephron. You know, kidney has a lot of tubes. These specialized tubes are called, I will, these specialized tubes which are present in the kidney, they are called nephrons. Nephrons, right? How many nephrons you have in your kidney, Dr. Nazanin? You don't never sit and count it. Okay, what about you, Shireen? How many nephrons you have in one kidney? In one kidney? In one kidney, yes. This is a very important concept because the whole renal physiology, look, no, when you say distal convoluted tubule or con proximal convoluted tubules, you are talk talking about, about the parts of the nephron. You get it? Nephron is an epithelial tube. I will discuss into detail later. But whole renal physiology is the, uh, mostly about the functions of nephron, how the nephrons work. So good students should know at least some idea that how many nephrons we have in one kidney. Yes, please. You know idea, yes. Oh. Oh, he knows it, that he's a millionaire, as far as nephrons are concerned. Yes, we have about 1.1 uh, million nephron in one kidney. So you can say 2 to 2.5 million nephrons you have were working in both healthy kidneys. Is that right? I've just drawn one nephron. Nephron is made of what substance? It is made of connective tissue cells, or it is made of epithelial cells, or it is made of what type of cells? It's a tube which is made of a lot of epithelial cells. This is a tube which is made of epithelial cells. In later, lect later lectures, we'll go into detail of different parts of the nephron and how epithelium modifies along the different part of nephron. For a while, you just trust me that nephron is just made of epithelial cells. Is that right? And even this uh, is also having epithelial cells. This is Bowman space. Right? This is the filtration unit. Now what really happens? That most of the drugs which come into your body, let's suppose this is a liver cell. This is a liver cell. Mostly what happens, that you have taken a drug orally, and this drug is highly lipid soluble. You have taken a drug or a substance orally, and this is highly lipid soluble. Because it is lipid soluble, it will dissolve into mucosal membranes, and it will go to the, through the portal circulation, it will pass through liver, and then it will go to the general circulation. Now this is lipid soluble drug coming into your blood. Now, the point which I want to put, that lipid soluble substances can cross biological membranes. Lipid soluble substances can cross biological membranes. What are the biological membranes? Like GAT mucosal membrane, like blood brain barrier, blood brain barrier, like placental barrier, these are different examples of biological membranes. A substance which is highly lipid soluble, that will easily absorb from the GAT and go to your circulation. Now you imagine that let's suppose this substance was supposed to work on these cells. Every drug has to work on certain area. Let's suppose this substance was supposed to function on these cells and bring some biological changes in the body. Now, the point which I want to highlight now, that how this substance can go out of the body. Once it has entered, how it can go out of the body, right? This is liver. And here is your, suppose I make two hepatocytes, right? And here is your, what is this system? Suppose biliary drainage system, you know, bile system drain into, did you know? Is that right? 
Now listen carefully. This substance, again, this substance has gone into the body, right? And it is performing its function on the target tissue. Is that right? Now this substance should stay forever in your body or should go out of your body? It should go out. We don't want drugs to stay forever in our body. Now, we want it to go out. If it remains lipid soluble, now listen carefully. One way is it can go out through liver. Other way is it can go out through kidney. Is that right? Let's see. If this is lipid soluble, it enters into liver cells and if liver cells by special pumps, if liver cells push this drug into biliary system so that it should go out through bile, you know, it will never go out. Because it is highly, highly lipid soluble, again from here it will come out, come back. You understand it? Because drug was highly lipid soluble, even if from hepatocyte it shifts to the biliary drainage system, through the bile it will come to the GIT, of course, uh, leaven of the GIT, but because it is lipid soluble, it will again absorb from the GIT mucosa and back to the body. So do you think the highly lipid soluble drug can, uh, can we get rid of them through this hepato biliary system? No. We cannot. Now we'll try other route. What is the other route? Kidney, low, okay, drug is here. Now it is again highly lipid soluble. So if it is highly lipid soluble, you know epithelial membranes are, epithelial cells have the membranes made of lipids, lipid bilayer. You remember every cell has a lipid bilayer. So epithelial cells are also having lipid bilayer. If this is highly lipid soluble, it will dissolve into membranes of epithelial cells and again go back to the body. So as it is passing forward, it will come back to the body because it, it is lipid soluble so it can dissolve into uh, epithelial cells membrane and come back to the body. Do you think then it has to go down into urine? No. What is the principle I am trying to highlight? When drugs, drugs or hormones or any substance which, has, which is present in your body, if it is highly lipid soluble, we cannot get it out through mo two most effective systems. The two basic, two basic most effective system will fail. One is the hepatobiliary system, other is the renal system. How we can really get the substance out of the body? One of the best ways to convert this lipid soluble substance into water soluble substance. Now, Vakas will tell us how we can convert a lipid soluble substance into water soluble substance. For example, this is a lipid soluble substance. And here now it is water soluble substance. How is this lipid soluble substance is converted into water soluble substance? What is the method? Anyone who knows? Have you ever studied pharmacology, something called pharmacology? Yeah, yeah we keep on learning about the drugs, how they go out of the body, their metabolite. This is a very, very basic principle. Uh, what? Excellent. You know, the one, there are two ways to convert lipid soluble substance into water soluble. Simply, this is a lipid soluble substance and you add to it highly charged molecule. Let's suppose this molecule is highly charged. Name of this molecule is, suppose glucuronic acid. It's a derivative of glucose. Many hepatocytes produce, you know, hepatocytes can produce glucuronic acid. And this is glucuronic acid is highly charged molecule. And this highly charged or polar cap, you can attach with lipid soluble. And now this complex, okay, it will become sad now, right? It is having a, highly glucuronic acid or any other substance. It is now fused with any substance in the hepatocyte and with the substance is highly charged. And so this new complex is highly polar. Because this new complex is highly polar, so it becomes water soluble. The, such reactions are called conjugation reaction because one molecule is conjugated with the other molecule. Have you heard of it? Conjugation reactions and the drugs they mentioned, this drug or toxin undergoes conjugation reaction. It may conjugate with the glucuronic acid. It may conjugate with sulfates and many other products. Is that right? So it becomes water soluble. This is one way. Another way is also, 
Another way to convert lipid soluble substance into water soluble is that from the substance you bring out some highly polar group. This was the tongue of the molecule and it was previously hiding. If tongue is highly charged, it brings its tongue out. What I mean by this? That you are having, this is a drug. This drug has this component which is highly charged. But normally it is hiding in, in its structure. So it looks like lipid soluble. But when this drug passes through the liver, hepatocyte is exposed its charged molecule component. And when its charged component is exposed, this becomes water soluble. Or in this example, until its tongue is in, tongue is a one of the special group of chemical group related with this molecule. Until that tongue is in or that highly polar uh, chain is in, uh, this is lipid soluble. But when it passes through the liver, it converts into more polar compound. This is another way. This is another way that this converts into more polar compound, not by addition of something new, but simply by exposing its own polar unit. This is how substances get polar. Now, if a substance get polar, look here. I make this that now suppose this substance has is polar. This was lipid soluble substance. This was lipid soluble substance, right? And this lipid soluble substance has been converted in the hepatocytes into a polar compound. These processes are called what are the name of such processes? Biotransformation. Transformation in the molecules within the biological system. Changes in the molecule within the biological system. So what are these called? Biotransformation reaction. Have you heard of them? Then I tell you something interesting. In, you have heard that the biotransformation one reaction and their biotransformation two reactions. Heard of it? In biotransformation one reaction, right? Molecule is forced to express some inner, inner charge group or it is modified to express charge group. This is biotransformation one reaction. This is biotransformation, biotransformation type one reaction. But when you uh, lipid soluble substances are added or conjugated with another highly polar molecule, these are called bio transformation two reactions. This is a very basic pharma. The biotransformation one reactions, first of all, what are biotransformation reactions? Biotransformation reactions are very simple reactions uh, which alter the molecular structures within the biological system. Right? In the liver, most of the drugs pass through biotransformation one or biotransformation two reactions. When in the liver, Drugs are passing through biotransformation one reaction, they expose more polar molecules. They are modified in such a way, right? But when in the liver, uh, drugs are passing through biotransformation type two reactions, they are conjugated with more polar compound. And a very interesting news. Many drugs pass first through biotransformation one reaction and then sequentially they pass through biotransformation two reactions. First molecule bring the charred tongue out and then you put the cap which is highly charged and it becomes super polar water soluble compound. It's a very basic thing we should learn in the very first lecture of pharma. How the body is deal, how body is going to get rid of the drugs. They are not there to be accumulated forever. Right? Now, this molecule is what? Polar compound. Now our lipid soluble substance has been converted into polar compound. Because it has been converted into polar compound, now it is the discretion of hepatocyte that this can this polar compound can go out of hepatocyte easily? No, because hepatocytes are again made of lipid membranes. So within the hepatocyte when lipid compound convert into polar compound, these polar compounds are trapped within the hepatocyte. Now where they will go? Will they go to the blood? Suppose this is circulatory system. On one face of hepatocyte we have blood. On other face of hepatocyte we have bile. Now it is the pure discretion of hepatocytes that some substances hepatocytes throw into actively because they cannot dissolve into membrane. Uh, now hepatocytes will need active transporter. They will need special transporter and transport this substance maybe into bile. 
or in some other examples it will use some other type of transporter and pump this substance because this is trapped it will not diffuse out easily so pump this substance into circulation so these are the hepatocyte membranes which decide that once a compound you could not understand it let me tell you what is happening let's focus this area especially what is happening that this was a lipid soluble molecule by biotransformation reaction it has been converted into water soluble molecule this water soluble molecule is no more lipid soluble so it cannot diffuse through the membranes of hepatocyte so such molecules which are biotransformed into more polar compounds and water soluble compound they are trapped within the hepatocytes now it is up to hepatocytes hepatocytes on one side have bile running biliary system running on other side hepatocytes have sinusoids running which are the blood system running is that right now if on the hepatocyte here is the biliary system and here is the blood system now it's up to me that uh, different sub some substances i actively transport into biliary system and other substances i actively transport into blood system and still some other substances i actively transport into both systems now it depends on that if this substance is actively transported into biliary system this highly uh, charged molecule it will come down and when this will come down into this area do you think this uh, highly charged molecule can dissolve into no so only destination is flush system is it right because it cannot reabsorb from mucosal membrane so we got rid of this compound out of the body is that right this is one thing second thing is if it it has opted if a hepatocyte has opted to throw this compound into circulatory system then what happens this a uh, compound from the circulatory system will easily filter into get okay, not uh, you can say nephron now let's be more technical this substance will filter into nephron but once it filter into nephron do you think this substance can dissolve into these lipid membranes of the epithelial cells no, it cannot so where the where is the only destination yeah. urine i think urine comes out of kidney these days right so what i'm talking about that this is how we can get the substances out through fecal route or substances out through urinary route now i will brief all of it because it's a very very important concept you must have studied in physiology lot of hormones yeah. if someone asks you hormones once they are produced are they there in the body forever no for example you become angry epinephrine should adrenaline shot there from Do you think that epinephrine should remain in your blood high forever? No. no. Where it goes? It it biotransforms into more lipid, uh, highly charged molecules. Then most of the uh, biotransformed products of epinephrine they go out through urine. Is that right? So, if you have studied into chronology, it must be clear to you that how these hormones which are produced in the body go out of the body. Again, all of those compounds are converted into. water water soluble system right in the same way all the drugs you take if they are going out of the body with few exceptions like some gases go out through the lungs like anesthetic gases but most of them either go through the fecal route or they go out through urinary route or a fecal route is usually called hepato biliary route is that right that is called hepato biliary route now another question which is there let's go back to our in the same way why liver is busy in these things pharmaceutical companies were not there 1 million years back am, am i right there were no much many drugs so called drugs which we have now so wh what liver was supposed to do then excellent because you know lower animal they keep on eating anything they don't uh, real you have seen cow does it sterilize its or microwave its material no it keeps on eating everything and liver evolved because most of the substances they pass from the git through the liver to the circulation so liver was a major detoxifier system and it is still major detoxifier system right that liver has a responsibility to convert the lipid soluble substances the toxins or drugs or other substances into more water soluble substances and then if a hepatocyte through that substance into biliary system they will go out through hepato biliary system or hepatocytes through such substances into uh, circulatory system they will get, go out through urinary system am i clear now 
we have discussed that many metabolic waste products go out through urine as well as many many drugs go out through urine especially they are more polar metabolites is that right so we can say there are many drugs and third substance which goes out third type of substances like toxins many toxins which also enter in your body right not all of the toxins but many toxins will go out through urinary system do you have any question here no now very briefly what are the special regulatory functions of the kidney what are the special regulatory functions of the kidney up to now we have discussed the excretory functions of the kidney now we are going to talk about regulatory functions of the kidney they regulate balance of certain substances in our body first of all kidney is very well known to regulate the water balance all of you know that if you take more water it will pass out more water if you take less water kidney will conserve the water we'll we'll discuss in detail later how kidney uh, makes diluted urine and concentrated urine but it is very important for water balance then it is also concerned with electrolyte balance it is also concerned with electrolyte balance electrolyte balance serum electrolyte balance really depends on renal function good renal function right and third excret uh, regulatory function is yes plays that is also extremely important kidney plays a major role along with the lung in that function it regulates something in your body so that your enzymes work well because enzyme work on a specific ph so kidney is regulating acid base balance again there will be 3 hours lecture on this 3 or 4 hours lecture that how kidney is regulating the acid base balance in your body and how kidney diseases disturb produce acidosis and alkalosis but we are just laying down the foundations today fine so kidney is concerned with water balance it is concerned with electrolyte balance it is concerned with acid base balance is that right okay about the electrolyte i don't know i'm a bit sensitive or why because good students should know at least the balance concentration of few important electrolytes uh what is the sodium concentration in a normal person in the blood sodium level in the normal person yeah of course in the blood yeah 140 what 140 kilograms milligrams machine guns yeah 140 you should always remember units we are doctors yes 140 what millimol per liter right anyway it's good still he should get the credit he remembers 140 sodium is 140 millimol per liter uh, we can also call it 140 milli equivalent per liter but you know our body has not read the books so it's little bit fluctuate isn't it so truly speaking normal sodium level should be considered 135 to 145 milli equivalents or milli mole per liter it's same thing five unit up or down is well tolerated is that right when you are in the junior classes you should remember central figure but as you become more senior you should know the normal range because you are going to be a doctor and you must know when to consider a patient normal and when should be considered the electrolyte imbalance has occurred right so it is about 135 to 145 milli equivalents or milli moles per liter what about potassium level normal potassium level in the plasma or blood yes mr bokas is trying to say something 60 to 80 you will find this level normally in the graveyards right uh, i want a living human being what is the level of potassium in living human beings who are normally functional is that right normally functional yeah it's really low uh, how much i don't know he has said low or high Below five five what is tanks Oh, yes you always mention the units with it right that's good potassium is again good boys should remember the whole including the good girls 
रेंज थ्री पॉइंट फाइव टू फाइव पॉइंट फाइव मिली मोल और मिली इक्वलेंट्स पर लीटर इज दट राइट दैट इज टू डेंजरस यू नो अबाउट वन पीपल रीच एट द लेवल ऑफ सेवन पॉइंट फाइव और एट यूजली दे आर डेड Is that right? So I don't know. Maybe you have been putting the potassium to dead body, <laughs> right? So anyway, no problem. Uh, you are going to work such formulas. You know, it is being recorded. They will catch you, <laughs> right? With your intentions. Okay. Now what we are talking about? <laughs> that I'm just kidding, right? We, uh, so 3.5 to 5.5 milli equivalent per liter is the normal range of potassium level, and every good doctor should know well. But you know, your central CPU you become really tired. And if you want to remember one of these value, which is more important, Dr. Nazanin will tell us. If you have to remember one of these value, for example, you are those type of doctor that I cannot remember to, I already have to remember many other things in my life, and you are left with to remember with one, which you will choose. In clinical practice, for patients, life and death matter. Both are important, but which is more important? Yes, potassium level or sodium level? Sodium level, yes. Potassium, potassium level, yes. Sodium level, potassium. yeah. Potassium. Uh, this time majority is right. Potassium level is extremely important. Again, Vakas was eventually right somehow. So, actually, potassium level is more important. You know why? It is already little fluctuation in potassium beyond the normal value kills the patient sometimes. Right? We say if patient has a potassium level. You cannot study renal system without knowing electrolyte. Why I'm telling you these things? Because later on I will tell you how nephron is dealing with electrolyte and why it is so important. Look, uh, if this level is less than 2.5, right, we say there is hypokalemia. And if it is more than 6.5, we say there is hyperkalemia. And hypokalemia, severe hypokalemia, as well as severe hyperkalemia, both can precipitate dangerous cardiac tachyarrhythmia and kill the patient. How they produce tachyarrhythmia, we'll talk it later, right? So if you have to remember only one, please remember potassium level. Rather write it down that out of whole electrolytes in the body, the most important to remember the level is potassium. After that, you can come to others like sodium or calcium. Sodium level 135 to 145 milli equivalent per liter, but it can be tolerated even if it falls to 125 or it rises up to 155. Is that right? But little fluctuations in potassium are going to kill the patient. So you have to be very, very sensitive when you look at a uh, report of the laboratory, right? L lab report from the patient that what is the potassium level. And again, who is the master regulator of potassium level? This is your kidneys. You know, potassium is controlled at exit level. It is regulated in your body at exit level. It exits through, it enters through oral cavity. You know, you take a lot of food which are very, very rich in potassium. And it goes, potassium goes out through, mainly goes out through urine. Is that right? Do you think you, you are all the time marrying potassium into food? Never bothered. No one bothered. Isn't it? Why? Because Kidney is so master regulator of potassium handling that if you take more potassium, it will pass out more potassium. If you take less potassium, it will pass out less potassium until kidneys are absolutely healthy and their function is not altered by the drugs. In future, I will tell you many drugs change the function of the kidney. Is that right? Again, listen. There are some substances, they are controlled at the entry level. For example, the classical example is iron. You know, in many foods there is iron. Only you absorb the iron which is required. Extra iron is lost into fecal matter. So it means iron absorption is regulated at entry point. What is the entry point? GID mucosa. Is that right? Usually in a healthy person we don't absorb extra iron. Even if we put in the diet extra iron, it will be lost in fecal matter. But potassium is not well regulated at entry point. GID mucosa, usually whatever potassium is coming, most of it is absorbed. Where it is well regulated at exit point, that is it exits through kidney. So nephrons later on I will discuss are so master regulator of handling the potassium that whenever they sense potassium is going up, they start secreting potassium in high amount into urine. And whenever they sense potassium is low in the body, they reduce the waste of potassium. We'll talk about that later in detail. So anyway, potassium level okay. 
here we also know there's something called chloride, isn't it? If you know the levels of two cations, at least you should know the level of one anion. What is the normal level of chloride? It's around 100. <laughs> it is around 100 milli equivalents per liter. Up to 105 is okay. Is that right? So you can say around 100 milli equivalents per liter, but of course little up and little down is normal range. And what about the bicarbonate level of? Bicarbonate is also electrolyte, isn't it? Am I right? Bicarb, it is the alkali of your body, the base of your body, playing a major role in acid base handling and pH of the body. Yeah, what is the normal level of bicarbonate ions? No one knows. I'm dealing with the doctors, future doctors, okay? Yes, any estimate, but not like graveyard estimate. Any guess? It's graveyard, truly speaking. <laughs> you go back there, 135 is a very high level of potassium. In a dead body, you have to inject potassium. Uh, it, it, 40 is possible, but it is alkalosis usually. It is less than that. Before you tell me something new, it is somewhere between 22 and 28 milli equivalents per liter, milli mole per liter, or it's 25 on average. Is that right? Okay, these are, this was some talk about the electrolyte balance so this is a kidney which has to control the sodium balance it has to control the potassium balance it has to control the chloride balance it has to manage the bicarb balance and of course you should not forget your friend which keep you strong that is calcium is that right calcium balance is also controlled by kidney and many other organs that we'll discuss sometimes else but what is the normal level of calcium in the blood because very soon we'll leave the renal physiology, go to renal pathology, then we'll talk about these electrolytes that disturb. So it's good at this point, we must know what is the normal level of calcium. About 2.5 millimole per liter. About 2.5 approximately millimole per liter. Right? So we have discussed about few excretory functions of the kidney and some regulatory function of the kidney. If you are not tired, we can continue with the endocrine function of the kidney. Should we continue? Okay. So kidney is an endocrine gland as well. How do you define an endocrine gland? Yes. How do you define? Endocrine gland is any collection of cells which produce a substance and release into blood and that, that substance is carried away from there and act to another group of cells. One group of cell producing a product which is passing through the blood and altering the biological action of another group of cells. That is, this is the definition of endo endocrine glands and hormones. Am I clear? So kidney is an endocrine gland as well. Right? Right kidney is endocrine or left? Both. Okay, that's good. He knows it. So, what are the hormones which are produced by the kidney? Yes. What are the hormones? which are produced by the kidney. Erythropoietin, excellent. First of all, erythropoietin, excellent. Second is renin. This is also produced by the kidney. Then another hormone which is produced by the kidney. ADH. ADH is acting on the kidney. I think up to a few minutes before, ADH was produced by the hypothalamus and stored in the posterior pituitary. Yeah. It is still doing the same thing, okay. It acts on the kidney. Hormones from the kidney are different and hormones acting on the kidney are different. So I'm talking about hormones from the kidney, produced by the kidney and acting somewhere else in the body. So we have discussed that there are erythropoietin and there is renin and any other <coughs> hormones which are produced by the kidney. Have you heard of prostaglandins? Many kidney cells produce prostaglandins which regulate the intrarenal blood flow, blood flows within the kidney and even outside, right? So, but mainly in the intrarenal, so prostaglandins production. Is that right? 
So prosta it produces prostaglandins, it produces renin. Uh, prostaglandins are mostly vasodilators. Renin work with you, you know it that it convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin one, which is converted into angiotensin two. In angiotensin two, forces the release of aldosterone plus angiotensin two produces venoconstriction, arteriolo construction plus angiotensin two stimulates sympathetic nervous system. Angiotensin two produces thirst and many other functions. Right, so they are so angiotensin two levels go up when in the blood renin level goes up. Again, we'll talk in detail later. Erythropoietin, okay, that's an interesting situation. Which cells in the kidney produce erythropoietin? I think it's a difficult question. Or oh my God, he's selling. I asked which cells in the kidney, which cells in the kidney produce erythropoietin. He say white blood cell in the kidney produces erythropoietin, right? You should get a big prize for giving an answer which no one knows in the world. Yes, it is wrong, of course, <laughs> right? I thought maybe someone in the video recorded as the right answer. So in the kidney, which group of cells? Okay, this is a difficult question. You tell me, in the kidney, which cell produces renin? Juxtaglomerular operators. You have heard of this? Juxtaglomerular operators in kidney study, okay, you brief him later, what is juxtaglomerular operators? You have to see, right? What is, you know what is juxtaglomerular operators? You're very sure? Okay, that's good. So renin is coming from there. Erythropoietin, from where it is coming? If anyone of you can tell the right answer, he can get at least $10 from me, which I don't have right now anyway. Okay. Yes, I think you become active, you are interested in $10. My question is, which cells in the kidney produce erythropoietin? Yeah, of course, if we say kidney is producing erythropoietin, there must be some cells in the kidney where genes are activated, making the messenger RNA, the messenger RNA is translated, then a protein is produced, and that protein is called erythropoietin. Did you get it? So, which cells in the kidney? Yes. If this is kidney, and here is your nephron. You know, in the nephron, there's proximal convoluted tubule, then there's loop of Henle, thin part, thick part. I will teach you in detail later. Then this is distal convoluted tubule and collecting tubule. From here, the urine has go out. Actually, these are proximal convoluted tubules, and here there are distal convoluted tubules. Around them, there are capillaries which are called peritubular capillary network. Capillaries around the tubes. Peri, peri mean around, peritubular capillary network, right? For example, one capillary out of that network I draw here. This is a, and this capillary is of course having what? What are these cells? I think these are endothelial cells, right? Special type of epithelial endothelial cells. Is that right? Now, these endothelial cells, if I make one endothelial cell out, right, these endothelial cells, they are very, very sensitive to oxygen levels. They are having a special type of proteins and these proteins are called oxygen sensors. What are these proteins called? Oxygen sensors within these cells. So when blood is passing through this area, oxygen goes into these cells and they activate the oxygen, activate the oxygen sensing proteins. Oxygen activate the oxygen sensing proteins. Oxygen sensing proteins go and block certain genes. They inhibit certain genes. This oxygen sensing protein will go into the, go into nucleus, transport into nucleus. When they are having the oxygen, they go into nucleus and inhibit the genes for erythropoietin production. They inhibit the genes for erythropoietin production. This blue gene is erythropoietin producing gene. Am I clear? Now what really happens? When in your blood, RBCs are less. If they are reduced RBCs, there's anemia, isn't it? Then there's reduced oxygen supply. And if there's reduced oxygen supply, when there's anemia, your RBC mass is less, total RBC mass in the body is less, do you think you're carrying more oxygen in the blood or less? 
if there's less oxygen reaching there, then oxygen sensors are not getting the oxygen. And if they are not getting the oxygen, they cannot inhibit the erythropoietin producing genes. So erythropoietin producing genes are released from the inhibitory action of oxygen sensors. And they, they produce, what they produce, messenger? RNA, which will of course, you know, go to ribosomes and then that will, they will make a new protein and this protein will fold and come out as erythropoietin. Erythropoietin. This erythropoietin through the blood will go to the bone marrow house. What is this? Bone marrow house. This erythropoietin will go into bone marrow house and there it will act on the cells which are responsible to produce RBCs. Which are responsible to produce RBCs. So erythropoietin will go in the bone marrow, it work on er precursors of erythroid series. The cells which will lead to formation of RBCs. They are uh, in the presence of erythropoietin, those cells start working more, they survive more, they live longer, they proliferate more and they make more RBCs. You may be thinking, what's the fun to explain it at this moment? The reason being, there's a lot of clinical talk about it these days. That if your kidneys fail, both kidneys fail, there are many dis problems in the body. When both kidneys fail, there are many problems in the body, including this, there is reduced erythropoietin production. So patients who have chronic renal failure, both kidneys not functional and destroyed by some disease, no erythropoietin, reduced RBC production, and patients develop severe anemia. And these days, how we are managing that, that anemia? Now we have, uh, you can say, genetically engineered the formation of erythropoietin. We have taken the gene of erythropoietin, planted into yeast and bacteria, and those yeast and bacteria provide us genetically engineered erythropoietin. And some these days, if someone has chronic renal failure, both kidneys are destroyed, we give him injections of erythropoietin so that this should go to the bone marrow and increase the erythropoietic activity. Am I clear? Sure. So now you have to remember, yeah? How long does it take the erythropoietin Oh, this is very important. That if I give you injection of erythropoietin right now, it will take about one week that it, was, it will start raising the RBC level. Right? It was a good question. Now, erythropoietin, you know exactly from where it comes, right? It is from endothelial cells present in peritubular capillary network. Uh, renin comes from juxtaglomerular apparatus. Uh, uh, in some lectures previously, I told you that here is the afferent arteriole, here is glomerulus, here is efferent arteriole. This is afferent arteriole. Some cells in the afferent arteriole, they are modified here, and these cells are called, they are, these cells are part of juxta glomerular operators because this this operators is made by modified vascular cells and modified renal nephron cells this group of renal nephron cells are called macula densa and this modified epithelial uh, vascular cells are called polkesen polkesen anyway but both together right both together, the modified vascular cells make this polkesen and modified nephron cells in distal convoluted tubule make macula densa. Put together, they make a structure which is called juxta glomerular operators because this operators is just along with the uh, glomerulus. And whenever this is stimulated, it releases renin from here. So, source of renin is juxta glomerular operators. Right, prostaglandin is produced by many cells. Okay. Is there any more function, endocrine function of the kidney? Okay, now we go to the metabolic functions of the kidney. We go to the metabolic functions of the kidney. Yes, who is going to tell me some metabolic functions of the kidney? It, no, that is the regulatory function. If it is, if kidney is dealing with the acid base balance, oh, that regulates the acid base balance. We have discussed it already. What is the metabolic function of the kidney? Yeah. Number one, number one, it activates the precursor vitamin D. It converts the inactive vitamin D into active vitamin D. 
Is that right? Uh, I will not go into detail at this level, but still, normally, you know, vitamin D, let's suppose, but when sunlight falls on the skin, right? In the skin, 7D skin produces a product which is called cholecalciferol. What is it called? Cholecalciferol. You have heard of it. This substance will go to the liver. And when this substance comes out of liver, at its 25th position, it has one added hydroxyl. So we call it 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. But it is still inactive. So when cholecalciferol passes through the hepatocyte, it gets hydroxylated and its first hydroxylation is at 25th position, but it is still inactive. Then it passes through the kidney. You know, in kidney it passes through which cells? There's some group of cells, of course you will answer, not me, right? When it passes through those cells, they add one more hydroxylation. First hydroxyl, uh, the hepatic hydroxylation is at which position? 25th carbon of the molecule. Then it passes through that, it converts into one, 25, single hydroxylation, double hydroxylation now. Double. double. Dihydroxy cholecalciferol. This is the really active form of vitamin D. This is the active form of vitamin D. Is that right? This is the active form of vitamin D. Right? So kidney has a metabolic function to convert the inactive vitamin D into active form. Question is that which cells of the kidney do this function? You know, every doctor may be knowing this. The kidney is doing it. But if you are really too good, you must know which cells in the kidney are converting inactive vitamin D into active vitamin D by hydroxylating, uh, by hydroxylation at carbon number one. Because those cells have an enzyme which is called alpha-1 hydroxylase enzyme. What is the name of that enzyme? Alpha-1 hydroxylase enzyme. You may have heard of it somewhere in your past. Alpha-1 hydroxylase enzyme. Though that enzyme is present in which cells of the kidney? Yes, please. Anyone, feel free to answer. Don't hide your knowledge. You can answer as far as you are wrong. <laughs> yes? No, polkacin is uh, supposed to produce renin. Yes, any guesswork? Naznin, Amal, you are left, Shirin. That which cells in the kidney can convert inactive vitamin D into active vitamin D? Have you heard of something called proximal convoluted tubule? Yes. Those cells, look at this cell. You know, after just, this is the proximal convoluted tubular cells. These cells are having, these cells are having alpha-1 hydroxylase enzyme. So what are these cells? These are the cells in proximal convoluted tubule and vitamin D enter into that and then come out as double hydroxylated. Is that right? So these cells, proximal convoluted tubular cells, these cells are very rich in alpha-1 hydroxylase enzyme which is supposed to convert inactive vitamin D into active vitamin D. How? by converting 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol into 125 dihydroxy cholecalciferol. Is that right? Did you want to know who stimulates this enzyme? There is something which stimulates this enzyme and tells this enzyme, please activate the vitamin D. We need calcium in the body. Parathyroid hormone. You know, parathyroid hormone act on these cells and gives stimulatory signal for the alpha-1 hydroxylases, so that more and more inactive vitamin D can be converted into active vitamin D. But that we'll study in detail when we talk about endocrinology. Is it okay? What did you say about alpha-1 hydroxylase? Alpha-1 hydroxylase enzyme is present in the renal cells. Which renal cells? Proximal convoluted tubular cells. Right? This enzyme is present over there. Am I clear? Now, what is the... This enzyme is supposed to convert inactive vitamin D to active vitamin D. But of course, this enzyme should have some order. Something should stimulate it so that it starts its function. So who stimulate this enzyme to convert more vitamin D into active form? Answer is parathyroid hormone. Because parathyroid hormone comes from the parathyroid gland. Parathyroid gland has chief cells. You know it? 
parathyroid gland is chief cell. Chi on the surface of chief cell, the calcium sensors. On the surface of chief cell, the proteins which are called calcium sensors. So when calcium binds there with the chief cell, it inhibits the parathyroid hormone release. But if in the blood calcium level become less, ionized calcium become less, then there is calcium sensors sense no calcium in the blood or less calcium in the blood. They immediately force the cell to release parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone does lot of function. One of the function is it will rush towards the proximal convoluted tubule and stimulate alpha-1 hydroxylase enzyme so that more, more inactive vitamin D is converted into active vitamin D. And when you have more active vitamin D, active vitamin D will rush to the active vitamin D will rush to the GIT mucosa. Excellent. And in the GIT mucosa, it will help absorption of calcium. Now you see who sense the low level of calcium chief cells, but they release calcium manager. Who is calcium manager? Parathyroid hormone. It does many tricks to bring the calcium level high. One of, one of the tricks is it will activate alpha-1 hydroxylase. Alpha-1 hydroxylase will convert inactive vitamin D into more active vitamin D. This active vitamin D will, G, uh, D will go to the GAT mucosal cell. And on those GAT mucosal cell, it will activate the genes it will activate the genetic machinery of GAT mucosal cell vitamin D so that GAT mucosal cell make those proteins which will help in absorption of calcium. So calcium lowering effect was sensed by chief cells and calcium is getting after through multiple signaling mechanisms in the body from GAT we absorb more calcium but parathyroid hormone does many other functions which we will discuss again in endocrinology. In this lecture of renal physiology, we will specially concentrate and learn the relationship, relationship between cardiac output, the relationship between cardiac output with the renal blood flow, renal blood flow. And what is the relationship between the renal blood flow and renal plasma flow? Right? And what is the relationship between the renal plasma flow and glomerular filtration rate? Right? And how glomerular filtration rate is translated into tubular flow? That fluid is flowing through the nephron tube and in the end how it converts into urine output. Urine output. Again, this is a very important physiological concept that a good medical student should know what is the relationship between the cardiac output and renal blood flow and what is the relationship between the renal blood flow and the renal plasma flow and what is the relationship between the renal plasma flow and glomerular filtration and what is the relationship between the GFR and tubular flow and eventually how the tubular flow, flow in the end translates into urine output. It means cardiac output is started with the cardiac output will end up into urine output. But before we really go into detail of this uh, system, I would like to clear some concepts related with the renal vasculature. Because urine formation, formation is a very important interplay between the renal blood flow and the nephron function. Let me repeat it. Urine formation by the kidney is right determined by the very close interplay between the renal blood flow system and renal nephron system. So first of all I will explain that basic concepts related with the renal vasculature. Then I will explain a little bit about the nephrons and then I will develop the relationship between the renal blood flow and the nephrons. After that I will explain these things. Right? So let's go to the very, very basic anatomy and physiology which is required to understand these things. Right? Let's suppose that here I make kidney. All of you know that this deeper part of the kidney, this is medulla. Right? I've made it three middle areas. Of course, there are more. Right? medulla and outer part 
is yes please what is that this is cortex this is renal cortex this deeper part is renal medulla and here we can say okay i'll make the calluses more clearly these are the glacial system right and here is renal medullary system is that clear now already you know that this is renal cortex this is renal medulla there is urinary collecting system but we have to develop the relationship between the renal vasculature and the how the nephrons are fitting into this picture so let's start with the renal vasculature uh, this is aorta you know from the aorta the renal artery is coming and renal artery of course abdominal aorta it will divide into posterior division and interior division this will divide into posterior division and interior division posterior division will be of course going to the posterior side of the kidney and interior division is coming interiorly this is the interior division and here is the posterior division and this is the main renal artery here is the main renal artery dividing into posterior division and interior division then from these divisions branches will go to every lobe for example this is one inter interlobar branches this is going to another lobe here is an artery which is going to another lobe so and so forth so what are these branches coming from here these are inter lobar branches right these are inter lobar branches right now let's suppose when inter lobar branches reach at the junction of cortex and medulla they divide into these branches which are arcing over medulla and cortex junction this arcing branches are called arcuate branches in the same way this will also lead to what is this branch please arcuate this is going to arcuate here it has gone to arcuate and this will also go to arcuate arteries what are these which branches please arcuate branches you can repeat it with me no problem so again listen carefully this was the main renal artery right number 1 number 2 you go for divisions number 3 you go for inter what is this lobar l o b r interlobar branches no problem up to here then they divide into this fourth number what is this yes arcuate branches right now what really happens from the arcuate branches from here there are branches which are straight going into deeper part of what is this cortex and these branches are called interlobular branches what are these interlobular branches like this and they are of course present throughout what are these branches please interlobular branches right so and so forth so they are present throughout but i will not make throughout so that to explain a few more facts so this was arcuate artery and this was arcuate artery and from here enter lobular branches now let's suppose we concentrate on one interlobular branch this is one enter lobular branch what this branch is doing you know from it these are small arteries which are going on the side what are these arteries yes abbas you can tell me what are these arteries they're going on the side they're off shooting from the enter lobular right yeah what are these called afferent arterioles so these small branches are afferent arterioles actually these afferent arterioles are supposed to bring the blood to glomeruli is that right now these afferent arterioles will break down into capillary network right they will break down into capillary network right and this capillary network which is made over here what is this called glomerulus what is it called 
glomerulus. What is glomerulus? Glomerulus is a capillary network which is produced by the breakdown of the afferent arterioles into capillary network. Am I clear? Now, here is your, okay, I will just remove this collecting system to reduce the complexity of the picture. But don't forget, kidney is really complex. But very, very interesting to learn. Now, from this nephron, glomerulus, this is now, I'm trying to develop the relationship between the vascular system and nephron system. This is the beginning of the renal nephron, you know Bowman's space, right? So glomerular capillary tuft, the bunch of capillaries of glomeruli are enveloped by the Bowman's space. And then this uh, part of the nephron, they break down into proximal convoluted tubules, you know it. And then from the proximal convoluted tubules, for example, this is proximal convoluted tubule, of course, it's in the cortex. From here, this is going down into medulla. And this is called loop of, yes please, Henley. And then it develops a thin turn here, and then it develops thick part of loop of Henley. And thick part of loop of Henley, turning from medulla to the cortex, right? And then this will divide into what is this distal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule again turn into medulla as collecting system collect cortical collecting tubules and then medullary collecting tubules then eventually collecting duct and from this point what will come out what is it drop of urine. Is it clear? Now what we have seen here, that we have seen that this is proximal convoluted tubule, Bowman capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, what was this? Distal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule eventually break, uh, convert into cortical collecting tubule, this is collecting tubule and then eventually this is going to the medulla. Is that right? Now, this glomerulus is in the cortex, but some glomeruli are very, very near to the junction of cortex and medulla. For example, if glomerulus is formed here, suppose if there is a glomerulus here, this is more near to where? To medulla. Such glomeruli are called juxta medullary glomeruli. Such glomeruli are called, this one type are called cortical glomeruli. About 85 to 90 percent of the glomeruli are cortical glomeruli and about 10 to 15 percent are juxta medullary. They have slight anatomical and functional differences which I will explain, right? First we concentrate on this cortical glomerulus, how it works. Now, what you have learned, yes, what was this artery coming? Yes, please. What was this artery coming? Afferent. This was afferent artery. This artery break down into capillaries, which is called which capillaries? Glomerular capillary network. And within this glomerular capillary network, there is some connective tissue and cells. What are these connective tissue cells? What are these connective tissue cells? Yes. There's some. These capillaries look. This is a front arteriole, it breaks down into capillary network. This is efferent arteriole, this is efferent. And here it was, what was it? Afferent. Uh, through the afferent blood was coming and through the efferent blood is leaving the glomeruli. Suppose here in the diagram, I have shown two loops of capillaries. One loop of capillary is this one, and other loop of capillary is that one. Am I clear? Actually, normally, one efferent artery will make 10 to 15 loops, or bunch of capillary networks, right? Now, here is, what is this? 
bomb and space. Is that right? Of course, you know this is also made of cells. We'll talk in detail about that later, right? I was asking that this capillary bed, this is embedded into some special type of connective tissue. You see it? This blue connective tissue. I want to know my students should be very, very clear about this connective tissue through which the capillaries are looping. You're understanding exactly what is the position of this connective tissue? It, look here. If my fingers, if my fingers, let's focus on this. If my fingers are the loop of capillaries, right? This loop of capillaries applied on one side of Bowman capsule. But in between the capillaries, there is some connective tissue. And here is also some connective tissue. What is this connective tissue called? If you have heard of it, I'm very sure. We call it mesangium. You are even for USML step one, even you are supposed to know the diseases of mesangium. This is called mesangium. Have you heard of mesangial cells? Okay, you will hear in your life, especially when you sit down for some good medical education. These are called mesangial cells and mesangium. Is that right? Now, what really happens? Look, it's a very unique type of capillary network. This glomerular tuft is a very unique type of capillary network. Normally, in most of the places in the body, capillaries on one side have arterioles, other side they have veins. But this is unique that on one side it has arteriole and other side it has also arterioles. So it means this network of capillary is present between two arterioles, not between one arteriole and next vein, venule. You know, veins, venules are very low pressure system, but arterioles are very high pressure. So, uh, because these arterioles remain constricted, so pressure in the glomerular system will be low or high? high. It will be high. The pressure as compared to other capillaries in the body, because in most of the time, okay, let me tell you a simple example. In most of the places in the body, this is the artery, and here are the capillaries, and then this artery will break down into what? Vein. This is a very low pressure system. So naturally it's a high pressure. Blood is coming with high pressure. It falls into capillaries and drains into low pressure system. So pressure within the most of the capillaries is very low. But if you put an arterial here, as well as you put an arterial here, then pressure in this area will be very, very high. This is a unique thing about the capillaries of the glomeruli. That the, this capillary network is, you can say, having arterial in the beginning, Afferent arteriole, and even the, they come, the blood to this capillary network is coming from arteriole and even draining into arterioles. So it's a very high pressure capillary system. And this high pressure help in high rate of filtration. The fluid will filter from this capillary area to where? To the urinary space. Fluid will filter into urinary space. We'll talk about that later in detail, of course. Right? Now, this is efferent arteriole. Let me make it here that this is now, what is it? Efferent arteriole. Now, where the blood from efferent arteriole will go? Now, we have to see, keep it focused, where the blood from efferent arteriole will go? Anyone from you? No idea. Look, it goes along, that is very true. But where? Right? Look. It will again break down into capillaries. It will again break down into capillaries. And now this capillaries will be draining into true veins. It will take the blood back. Are you understanding now? So it means, look here, that afferent arteriole lead to one first group of capillaries break and take the blood into efferent arteriole which break down into second group of capillaries then blood from the second group of capillaries really uh, drain into venous system of the kidney. It means first capillary network is a high pressure system and second capillary network will be low pressure system. So let me make it here. On this uh, diagram, this is, what is this? This is proximal convoluted tubule 
and this is loop of Hamilton. This will, efferent arterial will break down into capillaries and these capillaries, right, actually if you truly see them, these capillaries move around this proximal convoluted tubule. Now what is the purpose of these capillaries? Let me tell you. These capillaries, this capillary network is called peritubular capillary network. If there were two capillary networks, one here, this is glomerular capillary network and this is peritubular capillary network. Peritubular capillary network, peritubular capillary network is an enveloping, it is surrounding the proximal convoluted tubule as well as distal convoluted tubule in the renal cortex. Let me show you here. Truly speaking, this network of capillaries, it is like this. Right? You are understanding? I have just made it a, a easy diagram, but actually they just break down to capillaries which go around the proximal convoluted tubule as well as distal convoluted tubules. Am I clear? No. And then, what is the, their major function? You know, proximal and distal convoluted tubules are playing a major role, especially proximal, into a lot of reabsorption and secretion. So a lot of substances which are filtered, they are reabsorbed from this area back to the blood. A lot of substances which are filtered, like all the glucose which is filtered within physiological limits, that is reabsorbed to peritubular capillary network. Or all the amino acids which are filtered, they are reabsorbed. And many more substances we'll discuss later. Am I clear? Right, and then of course, these veins will go back into interlobular vein, then arcuate vein, then interloba vein, then divina vein, and then into renal vein, and of course not into aorta, into, not into aorta, into inferior vena cava. Is that clear? There's no need to remember that thing, but basic structure, vascular system is clear to you? Fine. So we can say that cortical structures, listen carefully, cortical structures of the nephron are provided by the by two capillary networks. Number one is glomerular network, other is peritubular capillary network. Is that clear? Now, a little complex thing coming. I will explain it to you. Let's suppose, what is this? This is your, yes. What was this? Please tell me. Is a, these were? These are uh, afferent arterioles. What are these? Afferent arterioles. These are capillary, glomerular capillaries, and these are efferents. Is that right? Now, and now, this efferent is in the cortex. This efferent is also in the cortex. This is also in the cortex. This efferent is very near to the medulla. These three glomeruli will be called cortical glomeruli. But this glomerulus which is very near to the medulla is called juxta. This glomerulus, right, which is very, very near to the, what? Medulla. This is called juxta medullary glomerulus, right? It has a different relationship. Juxta medullary glomerulus, it has a very short proximal convoluted tubule, very long. What was this? loop of Hanley and then it has very short distal convoluted tubule and collecting system. Is that right? Am I clear? Amal? I, this was cortical glomeruli. What is this? Juxta medullary glomeruli. Now, the real difference is in their efferent arteriole. You know that these efferent arterioles break down into what type of capillaries? Peritubular. What they break down into what? Peri tubular capillary networks. But this will not break down to peritubular. This will make capillaries which will not go around the, they will, these capillary loops will go down into where, where they are going? Into medulla. Are you understanding Nazmin? That efferent arterioles from cortical glomeruli, they break down to peritubular capillaries. But efferent arteriole from the juxta medullary glomeruli, they break down into loop of capillaries. We go deep down into medulla. And then from medulla, they return back into 
cortex. This long loop of capital rays is called Vesa Vasa Recta because these are straight vessels. They call them. Have you heard of Vasa Recta? Yes. Good. So these are called Vasa Recta. Actually, Vasa Recta. Later on, I will tell you they are playing a specialized function in maintaining blood flow. Very little blood flow in the renal medulla. They are maintaining a very little blood flow in the renal, in the renal medulla, right? So now, and of course, when this vasa recta turns back, they also drain into veins, and these veins will take the blood back. I will not go into detail of this venous pathway. You can understand when vasa recta will come back, they will go into veins, arcuate veins, then into inter lobar veins and then into the venal veins and you know it eventually renal vein and inferior venal tumor. Is that right? The point which I wanted to highlight, I will again highlight there because it's worth repeating, right? Now you people will tell me how it goes. I draw another kidney and now this is your test that have you understood this concept or not? I think someone has kicked over here. Listen, here is medulla. I will make it like this. This inner area is medulla, outer is cortex, and here, what is this? Is that right? Now, listen carefully. These are the, I will make only one example. This was arcuate artery, isn't it? Interlobar artery, arcuate artery, and what is this? Interlobular. And from the interlobular, what is it? Afferent and this afferent is going into which uh, glomerulus? Cortical or juxtamedullary? Cortical. And I make another here so that you really understand. Okay. What is this? This will make glomeruli. What is this glomerulus? Juxtamedullary. What is this glomerulus? Cortical. This is cortical glomerulus, Bowman capsule. What is this? Proximal convoluted tubule. Is that right? Right. And from this proximal convoluted tubule, proximal convoluted tubule, these are loop of Hanley, and it is turning back, then into which distal convoluted tubule, and in the end, collecting system. Is it clear? Now, this will break down into what kind of capillaries? What are these capillaries? Peri tubular. Is that right? And then returning back to the venous system. Is it clear? No problem up to this? Yes, please. This is afferent arteriole. This is efferent. This is interlobular. This is arcuate. You know, interlobar. Arcuate, interlobular, afferent, glomerular capillaries, efferent, peritubular capillary network, venous drainage. Clear? Clear? Claro, I think. Okay. Now, the difference is what was this one? It was which one? Juxta medullary. Now, juxta medullary, it has a Bowman capsule and it has also what is this? Is it clear? Look, this was cortical glomerulus and its vascular system and its remaining nephron. It is juxta medullary. Now, the beauty which you have to appreciate is that this efferent in the cortical was breaking down into which capillaries? Peritubular. And this will break down into which capillaries? Visa? Recta. So they will straight go down and like this and they will call back and they will also go for the now from here venous return. Is that right? 
So this is with a recta. About 90% of blood flow is through the cortical system and about 10 to 15% blood flow is through, what is this? Juxta, uh, no, 90 to 85-90% of glomeruli are cortical, about 10 to 15% glomeruli are juxtamedullary. About very most of the blood flow is through the cortical system and through the visa recta there is very little blood flow. Later on I will te teach you that in the medulla there is hyperosmolality, there are a lot of solutes concentrated into medulla. I will explain later. There is a lot of solutes, well come with lot of solutes are concentrated into medulla. It is very high concentration of solutes, right? Now, we say there is medullary inter interstitial, medullary interstitial hyperosmolality. Later on I will tell you what is the purpose of this. But this hyperosmolality is created with use of a lot of energy and it helps in concentration of urine, uh, urine right? Now, because we have concentrated lot of solutes into medulla, body does not want that these solutes should be washed away. Should they be washed away? No. Now, if we don't want them to wash away, then blood flow should be slow or fast? Slow. If you have some mud here, the water flow is very fast, it will wash away. If water is going little bit, it will not wash away. So, in the same way, visa recta has very little blood flow, so that medullary interstitial hyperosmolar setup should not be washed away. Is that right? That I will teach later how this hyperosmolality is formed and what is the purpose of having this area hyperosmolar. Is that right? Any question up to this? There is no question. Okay. Let's suppose that here is your circulatory system. This is your circulatory system, right? And here is your beautiful heart pumping the blood all your life, right? Now, what is the normal cardiac output? Yes, what is the normal cardiac output? How much blood is pumped by the left ventricle into arterial tree, systemic arterial tree per minute? What is the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle into aorta and eventually into systemic arterial tree. That is, you know, car cardiac output is equal to what? Is equal to heart rate into stroke volume. That, what is the volume pumped by the left ventricle per stroke and how many st strokes per minute? So, you know, that is 72 into 70 and heart rate is on average 72 beats per minute and 70 ml is the blood which is ejected by the ventricle, healthy ventricle in resting condition. So, it become about 5000 ml, right, per minute. So, it is about 5 liters blood per minute in a resting healthy person, approximately. So, uh, now you are studying the lecture, I hope you are somewhat resting, uh, at least physically. So, what is happening that 5 liters of the blood is pumped by your heart into your circulatory system every minute. Now, out of this 5 liter, right, this is the 5 liter blood, is that right? This is 5 liter blood and this 5 liter blood, out of this, how much blood goes to the renal system? About 20 to 25 percent, suppose 20 percent. To the renal system, let's suppose 20 percent blood is going into renal art, arterial tree, right? Renal arterial tree, there is 20 percent blood going. 20 percent blood makes how, how much out of 5 liter if I say 20 percent blood has gone to the renal blood flow, how much it make? 1 liter, is that right? It makes 1 liter. So, it means that out of 5 liter every minute your both kidneys are receiving 1 liter of the blood and of course there is no fun in explaining that 1 liter blood is equivalent to how many mls? 1000 
एम एल्स पर मिनट आउट ऑफ दिस ब्लड विच इज गोइंग टू द किडनी वन थाउजेंड एम एल दिस ब्लड कैन बी डिवाइडेड इजिली इन टू यस सेल्स एंड वट इज द अदर थिंग प्लाज्मा इज दट राइट यू नो अबाउट फोर्टी परसेंट ऑफ द ब्लड इज सेल्स so white blood cells red blood cells and platelets they make about how much 400 ml the cells are about 400 ml out of the one liter which is passing through the kidney suppose this is a glomerulus right so naturally what is this now 400 ml cells are passing through the all glomeruli you know how many glomeruli are there In both kidneys together, there are about 2.5 million glomeruli. I'm just showing one, but the values represent all the glomerular put together, right? And how much is the plasma now? How much plasma is there? Yes, if 400 ml has gone cells, plasma is 600 ml. So it means through our glomerular structures, right? Glomerular capillaries. Every minute, there is 600 ml of the plasma flowing through because cells will flow simply; they don't filter. RBCs, WBCs, and platelets they simply pass through the glomeruli next to the efferent arterioles. Right? Cells remain same, 400 ml cells. But In the plasma, the 600 ml of the plasma, as it is passing through glomeruli, a part of this is filtered into where into glomerular structure. This is your glomerulus, and this is which tubule, proximal convoluted tubule. And you know that this proximal convoluted tubule will go into loop of Henle, and this loop of Henle will turn up ascending limb. This was descending limb of loop of Henle. Here, pin turn ascending limb of loop of Henle. Thin part and thick part of ascending limb of loop of Henle. And here it is distal convoluted tubule. And what is that here? Collecting system and drop of urine coming out eventually. so let's develop the connection i said that heart is pumping how much blood per minute 5 liter out of that 20% is going to the kidneys it means renal blood flow is 20% of the cardiac output or 20 to 25% of the cardiac output that is approximately 1 liter or 1000 ml blood coming to the kidneys out of that approximately 400 ml are the cells and plasma is 600 ml and plasma is 600 Plasma is 600 ml. Out of this 600 ml plasma, you know, cells don't filter; they pass forward. But when plasma is passing through this area, right, fluid of plasma with the dissolved substances is filtered. Out of the plasma, proteins don't filter significantly. Proteins don't filter. It is the fluid of the plasma with some dissolved substances that can filter. But how much out of 600? How much filtered total? It is again twenty percent. This is twenty percent. Now you have to remember, out of total cardiac output, how much is coming to the kidney? Twenty percent. And out of total plasma flow, how much is filtered? Twenty percent. Now, out of six hundred ml, ten percent is sixty ml, and twenty percent is one twenty ml. So every minute, approximately one twenty ml fluid is. Filtered in every in in all the Bowman spaces together, is that right? Let's suppose for practical purposes we say it is hundred ml. This is hundred ml. Just to make it easier calculation, just play. Is this per kidney or both kidneys combined? It's both kidneys combined and all nephrons combined, right? The whole glomerular filtrate, total glomerular filtrate in your body every minute is about one twenty ml. of course it is 60 ml per kidney right kidney and left kidney both together make 120 ml 
right? Now we'll see that this 120 ml, as it is flowing within the lumen, what happens to it and how much appears in the end as urine. Is that right? That this 120 ml, when it is passing through the, what is this? Nephron. In the end, how much comes out as urine drop? What do you think? Out of 120 ml, normally how much come out as urine drop? 1 ml. Okay, what do you think? 1 ml. How? Look, about 65% of, right, again, let's suppose for practical purposes we make it 100 ml. If it is 100 ml which is felt entering into tubule, about 65% will be reabsorbed in proximal convoluted tubule. Lot of solutes with 65% will be reabsorbed into proximal convoluted tubule and remaining is moving forward. Out of this, as it is moving forward, how much is reabsorbed here? 10 to 15, okay, make it about 15%. Of course, there is a range, but for easier remembering, out of 100 ml, 65 ml is reabsorbed in proximal convoluted tubule, 15 ml is reabsorbed through the descending limb of loop of Henle, and then how much is absorbed from the ascending limb of loop of Henle? Answer is that ascending limb of loop of Henle is watertight under all physiological circumstances. So nothing is reabsorbed from here. You can make a diagram like this. Even if they try, water will not be reabsorbed from here. So it has to move forward. Is that right? It will not be reabsorbed from proximal, uh, sorry, thick part of ascending limb of loop of Henle. Then the tubular fluid will reach to the distal convoluted tubule. Now you have to understand it. We had originally 100 ml here and 65 was absorbed here. What was entering here? 35 ml. Is that right? Out of that 35 ml, how much is reabsorbed here? Yes? 15. So how much it become? 80 ml. And what is left forward? Reabsorption is 65 plus 15, about 80 ml is reabsorbed. How much is moving forward? About 20 ml. Is that right? Out of this 20 ml which reaches here, in this part, about 15 ml is reabsorbed. So how much is reaching now forward? Only 5 ml per minute. So this is the 5 ml of the tubular fluid which is provided per minute to the last part of the nephron. And this is the function of the last part of the nephron to fine tune this volume that how much should be reabsorbed and how much should be allowed to go into urine. Is that right? Normally, what really happens as this uh, 5 ml fluid is going down, under the influence of aldosterone, two, 1 to 2 ml or 2 ml or 3 ml is reabsorbed and a little amount is also reabsorbed under the influence of ADH. This last reabsorption is under the influence of aldosterone, aldosterone, which reabsorbs salt and water and expels the secretion of potassium. And ADH, which with the help of ADH, we reabsorb the water mainly. And usually in a healthy person, how much appears in the urine drop is just 1 ml. How much is appearing into urine? This is 1 ml, right? So this was your drop of urine and here was your collecting duct, right? This is 1 ml per, per, per minute. So normally 1 cc or 1 ml urine is produced by both kidneys together about every minute. Is that right? Now, it means out of 100 ml which was filtered, about 99% of the fluid is reabsorbed. And only 1 ml is 
usually going out as urine. From this, we can calculate if every minute one ml blood, uh, so one ml urine is formed, then how much urine is formed per day? It depends on how many minutes are there in one minute, one day. In 24 hours, how many minutes are there? Nazneen has calculated, I think. Never can say, you never had time to calculate. 3600 minutes per, per day. I think your day was too long. You were missing someone. Let's calculate, truly. Listen. One day, look, one hour has how many minutes? Let's calculate it. We don't need our shamidas for these calculations. It's very simple. You know, one hour is 60. Yes, don't tell me 60 ml, 60 minutes, right? And usually in one day, how many hours? Sure, 24 hours. So in one day, how many minutes? Is 60 into 24 is equal to 1440. 1440 minutes per day. If you don't believe it, one day you can spend and calculate it, right? Now listen. Every day we have 14, 40 minutes. And if you are producing every minute, how much urine? Yeah. One ml. So how many ml urine do you produce per day on average? Yes, about 1440 ml approximately, one and a half liter. So normal person produces urine output approximately one and a half liter. But normal range of urine output is that normal range of urine output is the minimum is allowed 500 ml and maximum is allowed 3500 ml. If you produce urine, this is the normal urine output per day, right? That normally you should produce urine more than 500 ml and usually less than 3500 ml. It means that 24 hour urine output should be more, uh, more than half liter and less than three and a half liter. I will tell you why, right? Yeah? Just a minute before you tell me something new. I will tell you why, we, why urine less than this is bad and why urine more than this is also bad. Is that clear? But look at one thing, that by producing one ml daily, you produce one and a half liter if you produce one ml every minute, then it means daily you produce one and a half liter. And if you produce five ml per minute, you will produce seven and a half liter. Or if you just rather than five ml, five ml is going down, all of it goes down, the urine output will be seven and a half liter. Or only 4.5 ml is reabsorbed, only half ml goes down, urine output will be about 700 ml. So this is the fine tuning in the last part of the nephron, that last part of the nephron is working on about 5 ml of the fluid to adjust what should be the urine output. But normally urine output should be maintained somewhere between half liter to three and a half liter, right? If urine is less than 500 ml, we say there is oligoduria. And if the urine is more than three and a half liter, we say there is polyuria, uh, less than 500 ml. Is that right? Now, before we really close this area, we must know that why it is so important that doctors say that uh, if urine output is more than three and a half liter, it should be called polyuria, not normal. And we should also have a very clear concept why when urine output is less than 500 ml, it is a pathological condition. I will explain. First, I will explain why a normal healthy person should not produce urine more than three and a half liter under normal circumstances. Of course, if you drink a lot of water, you will produce more urine. Right, now we will talk about that we have already discussed if urine output is less than half liter or less than 500 ml per day, we see patient has oligo-urea. And if urine output is more than three and a half liter per day, do we call it there is polyuria. 
we have to think that why for oligosuria the cutoff point is around 500 ml and why for polyuria we put a cutoff point around 3500 ml first we'll deal with 3500 ml listen first of all you should be thankful to the nature that it has provided to the urinary bladder because that act as a storage place when urine is coming and then you can release or evacuate your bladder as you feel comfortable socially and otherwise clear now what really happens that if urine output per 24 hour is more than 3 and a half liter then during 8 hour of sleep so much urine accumulate into bladder that it becomes very discomforting and you have to wake up and pass urine so it produces nocturia and quality of life is disturbed so doctor thought that in a normal person if he empties his empties his bladder before sleeping then he should have a sound sleep and whatever urine he produce around 8 hours that should be accommodated into normal bladder well but whenever your urine output become more than 3 and a half liter urine flow is so fast that during sleep you have to wake up once or twice or even thrice depending upon the degree of polyuria due to this reason they say the normal urine output should be less than 3 and a half liter because more than that will produce nocturia and disturbance with the sleep quality and life quality is that right you got the answer to this why we put, now the question is this why urologists and nephrologists are very concerned that their patient should produce urine output at least half liter are they urine lover or why they want this much urinophilia Yes, urologists and nephrologists, they are very, very sensitive to the patients. And actually, every good doctor is sensitive to the patient's urine output that it should be at least 500 ml. Because if urine output becomes less than that, that may become problematic for the patient. Let me explain to you. You know, normally, listen carefully. Normally, uh, what is the concentrating ability of the urine, uh, kidney? To concentrate the solute for example when metabolic waste metabolic waste product which are daily produced metabolic waste products like urea creatinine their potassium and many other substances these metabolic waste which are daily produced right normally what happen that kidney has to concentrate them into urine all the metabolic waste which are present in our body, they should go out through kidney. And of course, kidney has to concentrate and dissolve these metabolic waste into fluid. Metabolic waste are not coming out, out as tablet form or as powder form. They are coming as dissolved form into urine. Is that right? Now, so kidney has the capacity to concentrate these metabolic waste, uh, waste into volume of the water. Normally, the maximum capacity of a healthy kidney is around that healthy kidney can concentrate 1200 milliosmold milliosmold or millimold of metabolic waste in 1 liter of and 1000 ml of water is that clear if kidney does its best for example if there is water deprivation if in body has water deprivation, kidney will try to produce less urine. But maximum, then of course kidney has to concentrate the metabolic waste into minimum volume. But kidney try to concentrate the metabolic waste and milieus right into water. The normal highest capacity for concentration of the kidney is around 1200 or 1400 millimoles of metabolic waste in one liter of urine. Is that right? Now listen carefully. In normal person, how many, how much metabolic waste are produced per day? In a normal person who has a 70 kg weight on the normal physical activity and on average diet, normal diet, right? Such person normally produces daily about 600 millimoles of, a millimoles of metabolic, metabolic waste. In a normal person, metabolic waste are per day daily so daily how much you are producing metabolic waste around 600 units 600 urine units now 600 units of metabolic waste you produce daily now kidney can concentrate 1200 units of waste in 
one liter. So, to get rid of 600 units of metabolic waste, kidney should need how much water? 500 ml, that's it. 500 ml of water. So, it means that if your urine output is dropping, still if kidney try to concentrate all the metabolic waste in minimum volume, kidney need at least 500 kidney needs at least 500 ml of the water to dissolve the daily waste products. Is that right? Now you imagine, if urine output is about two and a half to 250 ml, right? If or your kidney urine output is only, the water available into urine is only 200 ml. Can kidney concentrate all the waste into 200 ml? No. So what will happen? Metabolic waste will start accumulating in your body. Metabolic waste will start accumulating in your body and biochemically in your blood, blood chemistry will be altered. For example, urea and creatinine level will start accumulating into, building up into blood. That is why good nephrologists and urologists are very concerned that normal health person should produce at least 500 ml of the urine so that his metabolic waste should be properly concentrated and cleared out of the body. If person is producing only 200 or 300 ml of the urine, then some of the metabolic waste will be retained in the body and blood chemistry will be altered due to impaired renal function or reduced renal function. Am I clear? Is it, are you clear now tomorrow if, if someone asks you that why we have to produce at least 500 ml of urine, you know the answer? Because in less than that, doctors get upset. They get worried how to improve the urine output. And again, you remember. From here, you can infer that those patients who have severe catabolism in their body, breakdown in their body, for example, a patient with severe trauma, patient with severe uh, extensive surgery, patient with the burns, patient under accidental breakdown of the tissues, such patients have a lot of proteins breaking down in their body. So, do you think if proteins are breaking down into amino acids and they are producing more urea, so such patients which are having hypercatabolic state, they are having more solu uh, more metabolic waste or less metabolic waste? The more metabolic waste. Who are the patients who are suffering with hypercatabolism? Burns patient, high, um, traumatized patient, uh, you can say extensive surgery, extensive trauma or severe sepsis. Patient septicemia, they are undergoing very rapid catabolism. Is that right? So any condition or forget about even a healthy person who takes a lot of, you know, chicken and lots of mutton. So he's put, put stuffing a lot of proteins in his body and amino acid. So amino acid breakdown will produce more urea and other products. So all those conditions in which you produce a lot of catabolism in the body of the proteins in these hypercatabolic states even a very good doctor, only the very good doctor will be upset even when patient is producing 500 ml. He knows that, okay, that normally a person should produce 500 ml, but my patient is under hypercatabolism. He should produce at least 1000 ml. And he will get upset whenever the urine output goes even less than 1000 ml. You get it? So it is not something like written in Bible or some other thing. The important thing is that this thing is you have to think with your mind, it's not fixed. That in a healthy person, you need 500 ml at least. But a person, but in a person who is under hypercatabolism and who is producing excessive metabolic waste, you need to run the urine output more than 500 ml per 24 hours. Is that clear to everyone? Right. Another thing which I would love to tell you that let's suppose this is your circulatory system. And here are your beautiful kidneys. Only very few people know how kidneys are beautiful. But anyway, I think kidneys are not properly respected and regarded. You know, heart is given unduly more attention. If kidneys are not there, you cannot live even to love anyone or to receive the love of anyone, yes. But they are underestimated, you know, like many people. Now look, for example, if kidney function is impaired, right? and urine output is, total urine output is uh, less than 500 ml per 24 hour. That is oligurea. What will happen? That waste product will start 
metabolic waste will accumulate so urea and creatinine level will go up maybe potassium and many other waste products now look when kidneys start failing this waste products start accumulating in the blood when these waste products are initially accumulating into blood blood chemistry is altered but still there may not be any signs and symptoms of a disease when only blood chemistry is altered and yet there are no signs and symptoms we call patient is suffering with azotemia azotemia have you heard of this term azotemia what is azotemia azotemia is a clinical pathological condition resulting due to renal dysfunction in which blood chemistry is altered right due to impaired renal function like urea creatinine are elevated maybe acid base balance or electrolyte balance is disturbed but everything is mild and yet there is no symptoms or signs of a renal failure but when with azotemia when azotemia plus there are signs and symptoms of renal failure the condition is called yes renal insufficiency is already there what is this condition called you have heard of it when someone has azotemia developing pericardial rub nausea vomiting sallow skin other features of renal failure what is that called what is this called we say yes now patient has developed uremia Ure have you heard of uremia uremia is not urine in blood Uremia is a clinical pathological condition characterized by severe disturbance in renal function which is not only having the azotemia plus also signs and symptoms related with the renal failure right for example patient may develop nausea vomiting or with that pericarditis or skin color alterations acid base disturbances leading to hyperventilation and many other clinical features right then we say patient is suffering with Uremia. Do you have any question up to this? There is no question.